Dr. Gabrielle Lignani, I would like to introduce to you. Gabrielle, tell us about yourself. What do you do? Thanks, Tori, for the invitation, first of all. Yeah, I'm a scientist, a researcher at the uh, University College London, and the focus of my lab is working on um, find new treatment for epilepsy, both genetics and acquired epilepsy. And as a background, man, I'm a biotechnology, biotechnologist, and I studied uh, in Milan biotechnology and then uh, did a master also in Genova, both in Italy, on medical biotechnology. And then I did also my PhD in experimental neuroscience in Italy. I was studying mostly the pathophysiology mechanism of rare mutations that cause epilepsy in the autism. After that period, I decided to move abroad and trying to use my skills on molecular cellular neuroscience and trying to do some more translational research and trying so trying to find a new treatment for epilepsy actually. So one sec, what does translational research mean? Means that is research that the aim of that research is to find a treatment that can go to clinic and help patients basically. Oh okay well that's kind of the best kind because that's what we want, right? <laughs> do carry on please Continue to tell us. So you managed to make before, it over to this island in the UK then? Before I was studying more basic science, you know, more how things are were working in the brain. And then when I moved to the UK, I joined the Department of Clinical Experimental uh, Neuroscience at UCL. Uh -huh. And there, there were three people that were working on new treatment for epilepsy. That is uh, Professor... Uh, Dimitri Kuhlman, Stephanie Shorge, and Matthew Walker. And basically, I joined their uh, their program on trying to find, on, on developing gene therapy tool for epilepsy. What's gene therapy? It's gene therapy means that it's a therapy that can change the genome, so the DNA of the cells, and you can, with that, you can treat uh, the, the pathology and, uh, and the rescue the pathology in patients. Because loads of people freak out when we say, oh my gosh, you're going to like mutilate our genes or something. But I hope you can tell us why it's not like that and why it's not scary, right? No, no, it's not scary. Actually, we are doing, I will explain better later, but uh, uh, we are doing a, a kind of a gene therapy that is not uh, create uh, weird things in the DNA or on the genome. And usually, in a way, the gene therapy is done in a way that if you have a mutation or something wrong in your uh, DNA that leads to a pathology, we can correct back then to the normal DNA and save and, and, and rescue the pathology, basically. Just, can you also explain to everybody, because not everybody knows what pathology means. Ah, yeah. Pathology, the disease that is caused, that has several causes and, and, and then can lead to a non-physiological functioning of, of part of Never. Yeah. Can, yeah. Be, can be linked to brain, heart, lungs, it can be linked to... Uh, Any part of us. But yeah. you're focusing on the pathology of the brain. Yes, exactly. Mostly epilepsy. How did you get into epilepsy, though? Why did you, like, make that kind of jump? Because, as you mentioned briefly, it wasn't your specific thing in the beginning. No, my specific thing it was more biotechnology, so modify the DNA. Yeah. <laughs> and um, at the university... Uh, during my master at the university, I had a brilliant lecture about uh, electrophysiology. So means the study of the electrical signal, how the neurons communicate each other, basically. And uh, I was uh, fascinated about how the neurons communicate each other. And so I decided to do a, a thesis, a project thesis um, during my master in, uh, in a laboratory where they were working on how the neurons communicate each other, but also how this communication is altered in epilepsy. So I started mm. to work on epilepsy and uh, I started to be more interested in that. Uh, and and after my PhD and uh, the thesis of the master and PhD on uh, studying the mechanism of epilepsy, I thought that it would be a nice step forward to try also to use this knowledge to uh, find new treatment, basically, for this That's person. certainly nice for us loss as well. So, yes, <laughs> thank you for making that decision. <laughs> so then what happens? Tell us the next step. The next step, uh, yeah, I arrived in the UK. I started to work with this uh, pro in this program, and then uh, I managed to find new ways to do this treatment and new approaches, and I got a fellowship from Epilepsy Research UK to actually develop a new, innov very innovative approach for acquired temporal lobe epilepsy that uh, at the moment uh, we are finishing 
the project, but we already received investment for the next step that is basically the next step is to go to, to clinic. So we have to do a lot of tests before going to clinic to be sure that it's safe for the patients and that have no side effects. But we have this idea that in two, three years, we, we should start the first clinical trial with this approach. Oh, okay. This is really cool because first of all, selfishly, yes, because I have temporal lobe epilepsy, but temporal lobe epilepsy, of course, is like one of the most common types of epilepsy ever. Yeah. It's the most common. And I don't know, maybe this is just, I haven't, it's not like I've read all the papers in the world, but we have a lot of research, understandably going into more specific rarer types of epilepsy, which is wonderful, but we also need to have more generalized research into the epilepsy that is very, very common, such as temporal lobe epilepsy. And I haven't heard that many people talking about this specific research, so I, that's why I'm like, oh, I get tingles when you're talking about your research into that. So when are you going into the clinic to do like proper like testing on humans? Yes, some patients. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, actually, actually I have to say that the first clinical trial for gene therapy for epilepsy will start soon and is led by Stephanie Short, Matthew Wolf and, and Dimitri Kulman. And is gene therapy for patients with a focal epilepsy that is also temporal lobe, but also other kind of epilepsy. Oh, okay. And the first phase of, of, of the clinical trial will be test the, the treatment in patients that can have a surgery. So they can have the focus of the epilepsy removed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and before that, we, we can test if the therapy works and probably avoid the, the surgery. But if mm -hmm. something went wrong, we still have the possibility to remove a piece of brain. As, the dodgy uh, bit. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So how are you coping with COVID and being trapped at home and what everybody in your team working remotely, what's, what's actually going on? How are you managing this? Yeah, it's not easy to manage it, obviously. I'm at home because at the moment in our building and our institute, we have policy of 50% of, of occupancy of the lab. Mm -hmm. So basically, we are a group of eight, 10 people, so only four or five people every day can be there. So I don't want to take a space <laughs> to people that uh, uh, that can work most, more on, on the bench on, on, and, uh, and uh, more experimentally, so I stay at home. Huh? But, you're the, man the guy who manages everybody else, really, right? Because it's your lap. Yes, exactly. So, but we are doing well. They are, they are really, really good. And they managed to also with half of time available, they managed to, to continue to research that is not very easy in this moment. And I'm, I'm very happy how they are dealing with that. So. And so like, I'm just imagining these guys in the lab right now, because I've seen a couple of pictures of your lab, which you kindly sent me a month ago, but like, are they actually, this is, they're not dissecting bits of human brain. What do, would they actually do with the microscopes that you've got? How do you do it? Yeah, actually in the, micro <laughs> <laughs> in the microscope that you, you, you saw, we are, we are using that to see the neurons that are, are in culture, are not in, in the brain, but is, is in, in a dish. Okay. Petri and, dish brain sample, yeah. Exactly. And we try from that to understand, uh, I will say before, the communication between neurons and trying to understand what is went wrong when, when these neurons are epileptic, sort of epileptic. And we try our treatment to see if that can go back to normal, uh, to normal levels. Basically, we are testing if the, our treatment can work. In neurons. And do you use computers and stuff a lot with that as well? <laughs> I mean, like, so it's not just about like looking at this lovely petri dish. Like, oh, it's not like watching because I, I don't, oh my goodness, this is just me thinking of like IVF where you see like the sperm going around in a petri dish. You know, it's not quite the same as that, right? <laughs> no, it's a, the, actually the neurons are in the dish are not moving, and yeah. what we are doing is mostly doing electrophysiology, so studying the the, the electric signal between the that that is the signal in which neurons communicate each other. And we use a very, very, very small uh, glass pipette okay. that we touch, touch the neurons and record. Yeah, a bit, no, you touch the neurons and you can record the electrical activity of the neurons. So you can understand how they communicate each other. So the microscope is needed to, to be able to see the neurons and like, to see the pipette. Your so. little pipe must be like so tiny. 
I can only imagine how small that must be to identify what you like, literally go and poke one neuron or you poke a load all at once. Yeah, is is I think the pipette more or less is one micron. That means a thousand times smaller than one millimeter. That's that's so. pretty cool. That's amazing. For that, we need a microscope to try to increase yeah. magnitude. I'm just thinking, I've got like a little microscope over here. And thinking, yeah, it's got to be a little bit stronger than that. This must like take a lot of funding like for this research. I mean, I know you mentioned like you've got some funding for this. And I mean, I'm always saying that there's never enough funding for the research. But just for you telling us a tiny bit about it and like these like rather large dar amazing microscopes you need and all these like apart from of course the cost of having the people of your team and like kind of paying yourself this sounds like really top of the range equipment and stuff you must be using yeah yeah it's, it's a bit expensive the research but it's the only way to understand these things so it's, mm. there is not really any other way that you can understand it the treatment for epilepsy at least can work uh, without these technologies so yeah, it's it's so cool. I think it should be an uh, an encouraging thing for people who are thinking of possibly getting into well mathematics, into neuroscience, into anything within the sphere. Because like after I've spoken to a couple of mathematicians about epilepsy research. Well, I just didn't used to think that mathematics was included, for instance. And I think loads of us have no idea really what you actually do there. It's like, oh my goodness, you're so intimidating because you guys are so clever and you just do all this stuff that is going to go over our head, which most of it, I must confess, certainly goes over my head. But it's really good that you've just been able to say to us, actually, this is the layman's sort of terms explanation. Yeah, we're poking your neurons and we're trying to find out this and that. And it's really, it's really cool because this is what we need. The rest of the population, we need to understand what you're saying. So I really appreciate that. What would you say are like the obstacles in your work, in your research? The obstacles. Mm, what makes it tough? Bar the whole funding thing, of course, and bar COVID. Yes, obviously funding and COVID are, <laughs> are quite a major obstacle at the moment. But yeah, one thing that I think that is very, very difficult in studying epilepsy is that it's very, very complex. And I think that we need to know better some basis and mechanisms at the basis of epilepsy to understand better how to design proper therapies. So I think that we are close to, to have a few therapies that I think that could work, but I think that if we improve our knowledge on the mechanisms, I think that we will have more possibility to find other treatment, maybe more efficient. On my treatment, well, I was actually going to ask you about preventions and stuff as well, because we love treatments that work. A lot of us aren't so keen on the side effects of treatments. What about prevention? Like anything there? Yes. Depends Depends on... on uh, the type of epilepsy. Yes. If it's a genetic epilepsy that is, is something that changed you in your the, the development of the brain, I think that an early diagnostic, for example, will be something that will help for sure. To, to Because if, if, if it's a pathology that happens during development, development, you can understand that if you understand from the beginning that there is something and you're trying to treat it, it's better than when you have, it's too late as basically treat it. Yeah. And I know that there are, there are groups around the world that are working to, to improve the, the diagnostic. And speaking about mathematicians, also mathematicians are trying to, to, to create a model to predict, uh, for example, if a certain change of DNA in a particular region of your DNA can lead to the pathology or not, because it's also difficult to say, okay, we we can treat the patients before see the symptoms of the pathology, but you need to be sure that this patient, if you don't do anything, will develop this pathology. Because we don't want to like receive treatment for something that wouldn't happen anyway. Yes. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of mathematicians that are helping to to develop the tools to, to try to understand if that mutation, that change in DNA is something that could be potentially pathogenic. I was talking to a cool geneticist the other day, Stuart, and he was just like giving me, and we'll be doing an, an interview too, but um, and he was just like showing me a tiny part of a gene and how that split up into other tiny parts and how each of those vary and how, yeah, that might mutate and that might not. And then you might have epigenetics mutation, but you might not. And you don't know what turns that one on 
actually, um, all that piece of the DNA on or off. And see, I'm not even saying it right, but it was just, it went over my head. And I just thought, wow, that is amazing. Because I speak to lots of people, and I'm sure I used to probably think this at some point, is that, oh, so we'll put a load of money into this research, and then you'll be able to look at all of our DNA really simply. And you'll say, yes or no, this is going to happen, mate. No worries. Here's the drug. Well, here's the prevention, but it's, yeah, it's not quite that simple. Eh? No, it's, a lot more... it's very complicated. It's for that we need the mathematicians. <laughs> yes. What, what are other types of um, roles that people play in, in uh, epilepsy research? Yeah, obviously there is uh, the, the clinicians. That, obviously. Yes, that take care the of neurologists, the neurologists, yeah. Yeah, neurologists. Then there are biotechnologists like me or biologists that uh, to do a bit of, of basic science about the mechanism and trying to develop a treatment in vitro and to design the treatment. Then uh, obviously there are behavioralists that, that understand also what changes the level of behavior. There are physici- uh, physics and um, mathematicians, engineer, <laughs> and there are a lot of different, uh, yeah, there are a lot of different. Uh, uh, and I say, yeah, you have people who are doing things as uh, simple, I shouldn't use that word because I, I used to do it and still do it, but like the paperwork behind it all, like the filing, the because I think without people in, in the back as well, who you need to organize things, you, you would be stuffed, like you need yeah, you access need, to things. We have, technicians, we have a lab manager, we have all the administrative people that are, are dealing with all the paperwork and bureaucracy and <laughs> I know there, there are a lot of, we, we are in our department who are I think around 50 scientists with a few technicians, a lab manager, three, four people from the administrative staff. And wow. uh, and plus we are very linked with the clinicians and neurologists that are... The, Do you speak at all to the epilepsy nurses? Not personally, no. In my project at the moment, no. But other projects that are involved in the department, yes. Okay. For, to develop a new tool for diagnostic, you need to speak also with the nurse to understand uh, to yeah. help to be helped with that. But yeah, no, I'm not really speak too much with the. Hmm. Like, I just I just ask because I've got um, a couple of interviews with epilepsy nurses coming up, and yeah, it's it's interesting to see how everyone links together. I think even if you don't work directly together at any one point, their profession and behaviour and the data they provide impacts your work and vice versa, right? But I yeah. think it's really important for us to sort of see this broader picture. Yeah, actually, um, we speak with clinician, clinicians speak with nurse, and so the clinician are in the middle of the... Great. <laughs> <laughs> lucky, lucky people. Um, so what would you, like, what is, does the next five years hold for, for you, for your lab, and for us lot affected by epilepsy? Do you I think? think in the first, in the next five years, will happen a lot of things. First of all, we will have the first uh, therapy, gene therapy trials for epilepsy. So we'll see how it goes. And uh, and also we have a few other treatments that I think that they will be finished to be tested. And so probably we will start other clinical trials. And I think that will be, the next five years will be a, a very, very big step forward for the treatment of, of focal epilepsy. So if us lot... I'm like, very positive and optimistic about that, but... You are, but that's what we need. Because loads of us, as you know, well, life can be pretty pants at times, so it can be very easy um, to fall down into that black hole. So and that's why it's lovely for people to hear about the work that you are doing that will positively impact so many of us. Even if it doesn't impact me directly, just knowing that you're doing that and it's bettering the lives of so many people and not just people with epilepsy but well I think that data can be we never know how what the evidence from your studies how that is going to benefit like random others right I think that is what is really cool about um, neuroscience and and research as well you just don't know it's that unexpected sort of part of it do you know what I mean yeah 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 it's unexpected but what we are doing is is to try to find treatment or, or therapies for broad a range of, of people with several different kind of epilepsy. So we're mm-hmm. trying to find really something that can really is a game changer for, for the 
for so, a patient. Right? So what should people do if they want to find out more about your work? Like where should they, I mean, and I know you've got like this cool website and stuff, but I often speak to people who might be interested in actually helping with research if they can. I mean, I know it's not like we're going to go to your lab or something, but what, what should people do if they want to learn more about you, if they are well, interested in... to put the, the, the glass Yeah. Right oh, I'd love to do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm so clumsy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> what should people do? Um, yeah, obviously they can they can can contact us on the website. That is is the one thing. If they want, they can. We, we organize the seminars on uh, experimental epilepsy where we discuss more on new new potential treatments and new understanding of the mechanisms. So something that if people are interested, you can find those in my website as well. Are they on YouTube as well? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Every every time that we we do one of these seminar will be on YouTube afterwards. So. And I can say personally, um, they are so cool. But I'm like, oh my god, I feel like I need a scientific and medical physiological glossary in front of me the whole time and time to look yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, I know. So sometimes it's very, very, very scientific already yeah. because it's more is more for the epile- experimental epilepsy community to to be able in this moment to be together and usually we we meet around the world from congress uh, conferences and now obviously we cannot travel so and and is the basis and the, one of the most important things in in a research to be in contact with other people to show the results to other people to listen to the results of other people and with that you can create new ideas and and go forward or for, uh, and do work that complements each other and no duplication because what a waste of money and time that would be actually that's what you said to me before um because the work that you were doing in Italy I think you said that you're kind of still working with these people in this other lab or something like that aren't yeah, you, you lab that, yeah it was a lab that I was collaborating with whether when I was doing the PhD and when I moved to the UK I, I continued this collaboration we are still collaborating and uh yeah, now it would be like 10 years, more or less nine, 10 years that we are working together. And I have collaboration with also other people because I think that obviously uh, I cannot do everything. So if I want to do something that really change and that can be something very useful, I need also other expertise from other people. So also speaking and listening to people at Congress and the seminars is very useful because you can understand, ah, these things can be very useful for what we want to test. And you can contact them and start a collaboration with them. Yeah. So I think that is uh, it's very important to for it's so, a, it's so exciting. And there are some prominent people, certainly. Well, I guess in every sphere, every industry, but yeah, often the people that you talk about, I'm like, oh yeah, I know about that person, I know about that person. And it's lovely to to meet and speak to people who it's not just about influence, but it's about people like yourself who actually care and want to make positive change because it's not just about getting out your your large da microscope and with your yeah. your pokey thing and just saying oh isn't this exciting just knowing that later on that's going to help people like maybe in the future people won't have to have like this dodgy bit of their brain removed you can just like provide some other sort of treatment you know yeah it's what we are trying to do so it's i think that uh, just just to be able to not have a surgery and be able to maybe decrease your your epileptic seizures uh, without having that uh, dodgy piece of brain removed. <laughs> yeah. And then not having the negative impact of that dodgy bit um, yeah. on your mental health, on yeah. things physically, and then being able to reduce your level of anti convulsant drug. That would be so okay. cool as well. Um, all right, perfect. Well, thank you so, so much. Oh, also for everyone, um, Rare Revolution magazine are featuring this marvellous chap, Gabriel Ligani, um, in October. Um, Rare Revolution deal with, you've probably mentioned, rare diseases. And <laughs> one of the things that um, also Gabriel is studying is Dravet syndrome, isn't it? So, which is a rare epilepsy. Well, that's one of the parts of Dravet anyway. So, yeah, so keep your eyes out for Rare Revolution. And we are going to soon have Gabriel on the podcast which as you know is imminently going to be launched so if you know anybody who's not a video person but you know they'll put their earphones in and like whilst they're doing the washing or whatever and listen to our podcast you can hear all about gabrielle there as well so thank you for listening and for watching us cheers gabrielle bye thanks story